See, when, when Jason and I don't have anything else to do, we tend to do these Facebook lives. That's kind of what, what's happened to us. So do how are you stuff. doing, Jason? I am great. How are you? I'm good. You ready to go back to work tomorrow? Uh, yes. I had a little dry run this morning with an emergency patient, and then we'll have a like a, a short uh, short day tomorrow, try to figure out our workflow. But yeah, yeah. To head back to you got it. those N95s ready to roll? Uh, I've been wearing a KN95 today and uh, extremely hard to breathe in, and I've uh, exacerbated my TMD. So it's something to look oh, forward perfect. to. I can't wait to wear that all day long. Oh, perfect. So it's going to be uh, fantastic. So that's the last we're going to talk about our current situation. We have much better things to talk about than that. Uh, we have an honored guest joining us. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Kaczynski. Tim has been teaching about implants for probably at least as long as I've been a dentist. Uh, and I don't want to make him feel old for that. It's just he's been doing it for a long time. Dr. Tim Kaczynski is joining us to give a he's basically give a presentation. Uh, and what's cool, Tim's a Michigan guy. Uh, so I, I've i seen him at the Michigan Dental Association a bunch of times. He actually spoke at our district uh, dental society, we figure, about 20 years ago, uh, which sort of ages both of us. But he is going to talk a bit about predictable grafting for any experience level, which I like, uh, following atraumatic extraction. So he's got a lot to tell us about. Tim, welcome to the Dental Hacks Nation. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> what, Definitely. Yeah, what else do we have to do on a rainy day in Michigan with, with no work? All us yeah, unemployed it, dentists. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're going to have to change your headshot there, Tim. You have, have a little more uh, PPE on there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a couple gowns, you know, there you go. So, Tim, what do you have for us today? Well, you know, um, when, when, when you called and you asked to, uh, to do a program that I think is, um, is pretty important, you know, I'm an implant guy. I'm going to date myself. been doing implants for almost 36 years now, believe it or not. Wow. And um, But one of the most important things, you know, we can teach you how to put these little screws in the jaw. But problems oftentimes um, occur and um, removing teeth, although we all do it, or I hope we all do it, can be challenging. That's why we have so many different pieces of equipment in the office. And so we've developed a technique that I think um, is very, very helpful to uh, especially the general dentists out there, the younger general dentists. Um, in removing teeth, what I like to call atraumatically. I have been criticized for that term over the years uh, as we've published it. You know, how can an extraction be atraumatic? But um, atraumatic meaning uh, we, we try to maintain or salvage the available bone. Bone is gold to me. If you're going to do implants, mm -hmm. bone is gold. And oftentimes, even though we're, we're very careful, um, we lose the facial plate of bone. And so uh, grafting with materials becomes a very, very important part of our practice. We know, um, you know, if, if we take a tooth out, bone is going to shrink. It's going to shrink down and in in the lower jaw, up and in the upper jaw. If we remove a tooth, um, the, the sinus uh, is going to enlarge. You know, a tooth root acts like a tent pole holding up a circus tent. And if you remove the tent pole, the circus tent's going to collapse. And we develop a situation that's very, very difficult for us to treat as general practitioners not enough bone to work with. So I strongly recommend that that uh, our audience and, and the doctors up there learn how to, number one, extract teeth as atraumatically as possible or minimally traumatically, and know how to graft certain situations. So I'm just going to show a couple cases that I think will be interesting, some of the different materials that I use. I'll keep it simple. Um, you know, there's a thousand ways to do what I do, but I'm going to show you what works for me predictably uh, that makes it make makes me very efficient and proficient. And um, I like to say I can grow bone 100% of the time in the situations that we need to. That's a bold statement to make, but um, but we'll, we'll we'll give it a shot. Okay. So yeah. real brief, uh, you you can interrupt all the time. I haven't done this with you before, so if you, if you want to interject, I know I talk fast. I will stop. I promise. Uh, but. We're going to learn some some very simple atraumatic extraction techniques. I'm going to, I'm not selling anything today. I don't have any any financial um, relationship with anything that I'm going to show. I'm just going to show you what I do in my practice every day. Not in the last 47 days, but um, yeah, exactly. Um, so we're we're going to learn how to preserve bone and soft tissue in treating our emergency patients. Our COVID 19. You know, people are coming in swollen, broken teeth. We, we got to treat those patients. We can't let them go to the emergency room. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not fair to them, and it's not fair to the for, to our ER docs. Um, socket preservation, um, something that is easy to do, that's not time-consuming, that's not overly invasive, and I certainly think fits into the process of um, 
uh, of emergency dental care uh, or essential uh, dentistry that we do. If we're going to take a tooth out, we should be putting something in to preserve that for future dentistry that we'll be able to do hopefully soon. Um, I talk a little bit about implants. It's not an implant course, but um, everybody seems to be interested in that. And, and if we're going to graft, can we place implants? Can we place immediate implants? What if there's no facial plate of bone? Can I grow a bone? Yeah, I can, very predictably. Fair enough. Does that sound good? That sounds excellent. Yeah, right. sounds good so far. I've cut our cameras off, so they're seeing uh, they're seeing um, um, your camera and the slideshow right now. So oh, the pants come off now. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay, great. Uh, too much information. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> so you know, uh, we we all know how to extract teeth, or we were trained to extract teeth in school, and, and it's amazing as I lecture all around the country. It's amazing, and, and we do a lot of hands-on programs. How. A lot of people do extractions a lot differently than I was trained. And it depends on where you were trained and who the surgeon was that trained you. But there's a lot of ways to remove teeth. There's a lot of ways to graft. Again, I'm simply going to show you what I do just about every day in my practice that's predictable, uh, efficient, practical, and very financially rewarding um, to you. So if you're not extracting and grafting in your practice, you got to get on board. We can train you how to do it. We have programs at our University of Detroit Dental School. Uh, we have programs in Charlotte, North Carolina. We, we can train you how to do these things. We can train you how to draw blood. We can train you how to do PRF and PRP. We can uh, train you how to build bone um, to, to a very high level. Uh, and it's important that we, you know, you know I'm a big educator. We had to keep learning. We just have to keep learning. So Facebook comments says uh, predictable is what they're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and again, we, we've all made the same mistakes over, over the years. You know, I've made a lot of mistakes and maybe maybe some of our audience here have, have done extractions and done grafting and they go back and it's mush. Well, it's a technique and it's a very specific technique. It's technique sensitive. And uh, in, in the 40 minutes or so that we're going to have together, I'm going to show you how to do this. And if you follow my recipe, you will get exactly the same results as I get. I'm nothing special, believe me. So atraumatic extractions, minimally traumatic extractions, are very, very important. So I'm going to talk about, um, and again, uh, I don't have any financial relationship, but I, I would not practice without this, these set of tools. They're called the Physics Forcep from Golden Dent, Detroit-based company, family-owned, just phenomenal. It's a set of four instruments, uh, upper right, upper anterior, upper left, and lower universal. We have these little silicone uh, cushions uh, that that extend onto one part of it. And I'm gonna explain the, the parts, the components of this very, very briefly. There are basically two components to this, to this forcep. I wish they didn't call it a forcep though, because it really, it really is more of a, a luxator or an elevator. But anyways, there's two components. There's a beak, which is like a shovel-shaped edge that will engage the lingual or palatal aspect of our tooth that we want to remove or tooth root that we want to remove, one to three millimeters subgingival. So uh, it's imperative that we have a purchase point. So if we have a broken down tooth, we have to, uh, I would take like a 557 surgical burr and flatten that palatal or lingual root so that we have a purchase point for this flat, fat, uh, flat beak. The bumper, which has a green silicone um, uh, insert on it, is not the working end of the instrument. And we simply put that up as high into the vestibule or down low into the vestibule as possible. It's not the working end of the instrument. It is simply used as a center of rotation uh, that allows this instrument to luxate the tooth up and out of the socket following that arc of rotation of this instrument. Now, what's really important here is I am never squeezing this instrument. You know how when we take a tooth out now, what do we do? Uh, probably most of us would take a um, periosteal elevator or a periotome and go around the tooth to try to break the periodontal ligament. I'm assuming we would take some kind of a luxator or, or elevator, go between the teeth and kind of rotate to get that tooth to move a little bit. Then we grab onto it with some type of forcep as hard as we can, and we rotate figure eight, mesial distal, buccal lingual, until the tooth uh, comes out. But what often happens? Crack, mm -hmm. and we hit tips. And we spend the next hour sweating. Our armpits get sweaty, our collars get sweaty. Um, uh, and, and we work really hard. We, we buy all these different instruments to get root tips out. And I can tell you, I see a lot of left root tips in the jaw. And mm -hmm. it's very frustrating for me as an implant guy because I have to get those out after the bone's grown around it. So 
the, the process of atraumatic extraction means atraumatic to the bone, atraumatic to the tooth, atraumatic to the doctor, because I'm not squeezing this instrument. So there's no forearm, there's no bicep, there's no shoulder pressure whatsoever. So if you have any type of, of manual dexterity issues, or you don't have a lot of strength in your fingers, this is a great instrument because we're simply creating tension on the lingual, uh, the palo aspect of this tooth. That tension is creating a physiologic response. It's creating energy and enzyme to be released, which is breaking down the periodontal ligament. What's holding this tooth in place? The periodontal ligament. The periodontal ligament is melted away. This tooth is going to disengage up and out of the socket without tension, without force. Without force, we don't break the, the facial plate of bone. Without force, we don't break root tips in the jaw. So it's an instrument that I would not practice without. You can see I'm not squeezing the instrument. I'm simply rotating my wrist. So in this situation, I'd be rotating my wrist towards the corner of the left eye. Really, I'm just putting the tension with my, my uh, index finger uh, on the very tip of that instrument. The, the other part of the handle is simply resting by my thumb. And I'm simply rotating my wrist. Now, it may take a minute or two. Now, I know a minute or two for us dentists is like a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, like, we can't cure for 15 seconds without shooing our assistant's hands away. And so that's enough, right? I get it. I get yep. it. But we have to be patient with it. And there is a learning curve with this instrument. Would you say for people who have tried this and said, oh, I've, I had trouble with it because like some people will say, oh, you know, I, I, I ended up breaking the buckle bone from this. Would you say that that's typically because they're trying to use it like a, a, a an older type of forcep where you're actually kind of working it? I, ab absolutely. It's technique sensitive. So mm -hmm. what that means is it's not a forcep. I wish mm -hmm. we could call it a forcep because if you squeeze it, you're going to break the facial plate of bone. Now, mm -hmm. in fairness, in fairness, when we do our full full day courses, our two day courses, when we do our CBCT analysis, oftentimes, especially in the anterior, uh, uh, in the um, premaxilla, the facial plate of bone can be eggshell thin. Sure, sure. So it's not our fault that it's happening. It just happens. But again, you have to be patient with this instrument. It is technique sensitive. You just can't squeeze the instrument. You have to create tension building up energy or enzyme, and the tooth will come out up and out of the socket. It's not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, it's intended to luxate the tooth up and out. Mm -hmm. So let, let's go with some cases. En enough of that uh, salesmanship. So um, maxillary posterior, we have a tooth that's deemed non-restorable. We know we have it's a three-rooted tooth. How do we normally remove this tooth uh, clinically in your practice today? Again, I'm assuming uh, periotome, some kind of luxator, uh, elevator, some kind of uh, molar forcep, figure eight, or if the roots are very divergent, uh, I would assume you would take a burr and you would yep. ice it in two, yep. get the mesial buckle, distal buckle, uh, uh, traumatic, you're worried about the sinus, traumatic. How do I do it? Okay, I would simply take this tooth and here's a little periotome that I went around the tooth facial and uh, palatal. And here I'm taking my upper, whatever that was, left uh, physics forcep. I'm putting my little bumper guard on. Very simple. These are these are, um, these are are one-time use. They're disposable, uh, very inexpensive. Here I'm placing the beak or the, the flattened shovel-shaped edge on the palatal surface of this tooth. One to three millimeters subgingival. If it's sliding off, Take a 557 surgical burr and flatten it so you have a purchase point. Place the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible. Remember, it's just that is simply a center of rotation or a fulcrum point. Okay, this is a, a modified class one lever, and they say the pyramids were built with class five levers, class one levers. So be, be familiar with it, and you're not squeezing the instrument. I am simply creating tension on the palatal aspect of this tooth, rotating my wrist following that arc of rotation, never squeezing. The tooth will luxate up and out of the socket. Now the instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total. It's simply intended to break down the periodontal ligament and luxate that tooth up and out of the socket. The bumper, I know you're gonna ask this question, is not holding the facial plate of bone. That's not what it's doing. It's simply acting as a center of rotation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna preempt um, this, this, the, what I'm talking about, what if you get a, 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 a ulceration on the facial aspect? It's because you're squeezing too hard. Okay? okay. 
And again, we have programs at our University of Troy Dental School that we can show you how to do this on live patients. It's pretty, pretty great class. So here I'm simply taking, we call this a tooth delivery instrument. It's a bird beak forcep. And I'm able to remove this tooth in probably about a minute. And I'm gonna say atraumatically to the facial plate of bone, atraumatically to me. And the third atraumatic is to the patient. Docs, we're not putting tension. You know how, how much pressure we put on a tooth that we're removing? And that head, that patient's head is going back and forth, up and down. They feel it. And extractions are very traumatic to the patient. I can't tell you how many times patients looked up to me and I removed this tooth and they go, you're kidding, right? What? <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. You must be really good. Well, not necessarily. It's a technique. So you can see these roots are, are fairly divergent. Is this a difficult extraction for some? Maybe yes. For others, maybe not. But we're able to remove this tooth in about a minute. My 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 shirts don't have low, uh, yellow stains in the armpits. My collars are, are clean. Now, we have a socket, and we always take a radiograph uh, post-extraction. Post I want to okay. make sure that I didn't leave anything there. And it's imperative that we correct the socket. You must have sharp tools for this. You, you have to, If you're going to do this, you have to do it right. You can't have instruments that we had in dental school that were in your lab drawer somewhere. These have to be sharp instruments, and you're correcting granulation tissue. Correct, 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 correct. Removing any in, in, uh, infected tissue. Purple blood is bad. Red blood is good. Just remember that. Do you like a serrated cur curette or do you like a... It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, another question that people will have is, are you are you concerned with the floor of the sinus? I'm, I'm really not. I'm more concerned with leaving infected tissue there. And you can see I, I harvested a big old snot plug of, of granulation tissue mm -hmm. that we have to remove. Okay. Is that a technical term? <laughs> yeah, it's a medical term. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Google search it. Yep. So this is one of my favorite uh, my favorite products. This is a um, an alloplastic material. What does that mean? It's a synthetic material. It's made in a laboratory. It's calcium apatite in a bovine um, a bovine uh, Achilles tendon matrix. It's a wonderful, wonderful. It's this is not a collagen plug, docs, and it's very inexpensive. So another question that that I often hear is, oh, my patients don't they don't want to pay for grafting material? Well. If you don't graft this particular site, that patient may not be able to have an implant in the future mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. a much more invasive procedure. You know, a, a Caldwell lock, a, a sinus fill material for $25, $3,500, and you lose a lot of time. So um, it takes a snapshot of this. Um, Osteogen, a great, great product. Calcium appetite, I've been using it for, for years now. I've done a ton of histology on it, and it will form bone it will convert over to bone in, in a very short amount of time, three to four months, depending on the side of the socket. So you can see, I took this material and I took my scissors and I actually shaped it like that root was shaped, right? We, we're basically replacing it. And so it's it's a, a, a crystalline material. Um, it's been used in Europe for 30 years, a lot of science behind it. Um, it's something that costs about $40 a plug maybe $50 a plug. So it's not an expensive. And all we're doing is placing it into that socket. The blood will absorb into it. And I'm simply filling that socket. Now here I've taken, a, I'm condensing it. Uh, this is not amalgam though. We're not condensing it like amalgam. <laughs> what's, the what's the consistency of that material? It's it's like, um, like thicker than styrofoam. Uh, it's got It's got some give to it. So, so when I'm condensing, I can feel it. I can see, feel resistance going in. So I'm, I'm, I'm condensing it firmly, but I'm not placing it like amalgam. Now, what's unique about this product? And, and if any of you have heard me speak before on grafting, if we use a, a, a graft material, like an allograft, a human bone from another human source, we must protect that graft material from invagination of epithelium. Epithelium grows 10 times faster than bone. And physiologically, the way this socket's going to heal, it's going to heal from the apex towards the crest. And epithelium is going to grow from the crest towards the apex. What's going to win? Epithelium grows 10 times faster. It's mm -hmm. always going to win. So we would have to invest in a membrane, some type of membrane to protect the graft from invagination of epithelium. With this material, the consistency, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. The the um, um, Achilles tendon, the bovine Achilles tendon, 
prevents invagination of epithelium. So the epithelium is pretty smart. It's going to follow the path of least resistance. If it can't go in, it's going to go on top. And epithelium grows about a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. Now we have a good, what, 10, 11, 12 millimeters of, of space there. So mm -hmm. it, it takes 10 days, 14 days, 16 days for that epithelium to grow over the top of it, but it will. So I will simply suture. I'm just doing two cross-linked um, interrupted sutures to hold it in place, but there's no membrane and there's no reflection of tissue. Docs, you're, adding, you're adding no extra grafting material to that uh, no. scenario? This is my graft material. I'm not using anything on top of it, and I don't need to put a membrane on top of this particular material. It's inexpensive. It takes minutes to do, doctors, and it's going to be predictable as heck. So very, very quickly, I just want to talk about my suturing technique because I, I see a lot of doctors suture. I think most of us, when we suture, we would suture from facial to palatal. And the problem with going from facial to palatal is with our reverse cutting needles, we will oftentimes grab onto a membrane if we have it and either pull it out or fight with it. Or when the staff removes the sutures in a week or 10 days, they pull out the, the membrane. If we have a graft with a membrane, that membrane must be in place for at least six weeks. If it does not, then the entire case is unpredictable. I didn't say it won't work. I'm just saying, I don't know if it's going to work. And our title was predictability, right? We want predictability. I want to know that I'm doing this procedure. I'm charging this patient X number of dollars. I want to know that in three, four, five months, I can put an implant in this situation every time without question. So the way I suture is I'm going to go from the crest or the occlusal portion towards the facial. So our reverse cutting needle is actually sliding on top of the graft or our membrane. And then I will reverse the needle and go from the occlusal or crestal to the palatal. And I just did two simple interrupted sutures here. I like to see my patients in a week and then I will remove the sutures and let the area heal. Let's do another case here. Actually, so Doc, a, uh, what, what, what codes are you using for that? And what are you what are you I'm charging saying, for? Yeah. I'm saying it again, the code. Uh, codes. Uh, the codes uh, and uh, uh, charges. All right. You know, we're not supposed to talk money. So we're going to talk generalities. Um, I, I don't know what the code is, to be honest with you. I guess I should put that in the slide. I apologize for that. But it's a grafting procedure. Um, and in our practice, we charge $5.95 for that procedure. And that's not including the extraction. So extraction plus 595 for the graft material, regardless of which graft material I use. Now, the, the osteogen material is $40 or $50. An allograft material would be $110 plus probably mm -hmm. $100 for the membrane. You know, So again, you can see the cost savings to us. And as long as we're getting predictability, I love it. This is a, it's a great material, except when the whole facial plate is gone. And that's what I want to show you next. Okay. I only use it when we have all the walls intact. Fair enough? Is, is, are there different sizes or typically is that particular size good enough yeah, for a molar space? You know what? There's a, a thin and a fat and, and they're the same price. So I, I would just buy fat ones and cut them. Uh, you know, it just, just as easy, I think. But, yeah. Before you, before you go ahead, would you, would you, someone's asking if you could review that suture sequence again. They didn't catch that. If you could just do that super quick. There you go. So, um, rather than going from facial to palatal, which we normally would do, that's how we normally suture, I will go from the crestal portion from the socket side towards the facial. Our, our needles today, our dental needles are reverse cutting. So they're, they're very specific. So they're, they're not sharp on the bottom, they're sharp on the top. So I'm taking this reverse cutting needle and you can see the, the photo on the left. I'm sliding on top of the graft or on top of the membrane if I had one there. And then I'm simply reversing it. I'm turning it around and going from the crustal portion into the palatal tissue. And I'm just simply tying, tying an interrupted knot. Did that help? I think so. I think so. It, I think, I, honestly, probably the person asking was thinking it was more complicated than you were, you were making it. It's pretty simple. Looks pretty like. simple. Pretty simple. All right, second case, uh, we have a, a molar tooth. Now, molar teeth, I'll use the physics forcep, but I always section these. I will section them through the furcation area. So I'm going to remove these teeth as if they were two individual mm -hmm. bicuspid single-rooted teeth. 
Otherwise, again, we see a lot of mandibular roots left in the jaw, especially if there's divergence of those teeth. So we all agree that this is a tooth that's probably not treatable. Um, and I'm going to, uh, here, I, 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 I shouldn't even show this slide here uh, today, but um, this is a, a very pointy, sharp burr, and I'm seeing if I can place the implant in immediately. So I'm going into, ideally, I'm determining where I ideally would want to place that implant mm -hmm. if I could. Can I get initial stability? But I'm going to remove the tooth now. So I'm taking my 557 surgical burr, and I'm simply going to the frication. Take radiographs. Digital radiography is wonderful, isn't it? I mean, it allows us to see things in literally six seconds as opposed to our old uh, film that took six minutes. So I know that I'm sectioned all the way through the frication. And again, I have to create a purchase point for my physics force mm -hmm. Placing mm -hmm. my um, uh, flattened edge on the lingual here, and then simply rotating my wrist towards the shoulder, not squeezing the instrument, never squeeze the instrument, and the teeth are removed fairly atraumatically in a matter of, of literally seconds, okay? Then here I'm taking my osteogen plug again, and same thing, I'm simply placing it, letting the blood absorb into it, packing it, and suturing it closed. You can see I have no membrane here, and it's exposed. I, do, I don't care because epithelium, again, to review, is physiologically going to grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. That six millimeters in, in a week or 10 days is going to be completely closed over. You can see preoperative, immediately uh, after the grafting, you can see it's still a little bit radiolucent, but you can see three months, I'm sorry, you can see three months postoperatively. Can you see the change in the bone? Oh, it's awesome. Now, now, very, very important, and a point that, that's often lost to, to, to Dennis is physiologically, again, the way bone heals, it heals from the apex towards the crest. So we have much more mature bone at the apical portion of the socket than we do at the crest. But I don't care if I'm going to put an implant, I'm, I'm blowing that crustal bone away anyways. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let that implant heal for another three or four months, and the integration is going to continue. So this is something that's going to be very predictable for you. Again, I've done a lot of histology, a lot of evaluation, and I know that I get bone formation very quickly. Now we have a site that we can um, uh, we have a site that we can place an implant in. Um, again, it, this is an important concept. I, I never block my implant cases. I'm going to infiltrate. And what's important in this slide, it's a very important slide, and I know we don't have a lot of time, and you'll, you'll cut me off when we're done, okay? But um, the mucogingival line is easily seen when we infiltrate into the mucosa. We must have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of our implants. We must have a band of at least two millimeters of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of our implants. Now, that can be very confusing to many general dentists. Well, how do you get that if you don't have it? Well, I can tell you a lot of people aren't aware of it and, and leave it, and the patients have symptoms afterwards. We get mm -hmm. bone loss. We get um, – uh, they're uncomfortable. Uh, food's getting trapped in there. So that, that is a rule that has to be followed. You must have two millimeters of attached gingiva. Here, I just took a little Sharpie marker, and I'm, I'm uh, marking it. So I don't feel really comfortable with my band of attached gingiva. So here I'm going to make a reflection. The last case I showed you, we didn't do a reflection, right? We just – we did. We had a socket. This is called an Orban knife. You're, you're probably familiar with it. It's simply a sharp stainless steel uh, blade. And I'm making an incision on the crest, but I want to harvest a band of attached gingiva from the, that crestal area. And I'm going to move it. So I'm simply taking my periosteal and I'm reflecting that facial tissue. I'm going to call this an envelope reflection or an envelope flap. Imagine a number 10 envelope, white envelope that we mm -hmm. use to nail things, and uh, you lift the flap and you blow into it. I did not make any vertical incisions here. All I want to do is see the bone, okay, and I want to reposition that soft that uh, uh, soft tissue there. So I'm not making any vertical incisions. And the reason why, again, it's very physiologic, docs, um, if you incise into mucosa, your patients are going to have a lot of pain prostaglandin, histamine is going to be released. They're going to be sore. They're going to complain. They're going to swell. If you do not incise into mucosal tissue, it is amazing how little the patients experience, post, experience postoperatively. Give them some Advil. And they think you are a, a wonder doctor. Try not to incise the mucosal tissue. 
-hmm. you can reflect through it. I mean, you can you can you can take that periosteal and go you know all the way down to the chin if you needed to. I'm talking about simply taking a blade and cutting into mucosa. Again, not an implant uh, course, but we we place our dental implant in an ideal position. We got good initial stability. So I'm able to place what we call a healing abutment. It's simply a tall screw that penetrates through the soft tissue. Now, I know I'm talking fast, Docs, and we can we can go through this um, you know, another time if you want, but um, I didn't have a band, a width band of two millimeters on the facial aspect of this implant. So what I did was I made my incision on the crest and harvested that tissue that what used to be on the crest, and I'm gonna simply move it to the facial aspect of that healing abutment. I'm going to suture, again, we do some suture, um, some suture programs too. We, we're going to suture around that healing abutment. So what I'm simply doing here is I'm going through the mesial facial aspect of that reflected tissue, and I'm going around the healing abutment. I am not, I am not engaging the lingual tissue. I'm not engaging the lingual tissue. I'm going around that healing abutment. It's a, this is a periodontal suture. And then I'm simply reversing the needle and going from distal facial and again, around that healing abutment, or if you had a tooth there, uh, around the tooth, not engaging the lingual tissue whatsoever. So what does that mean? I took the, the, the keratinized tissue that used to be on the crest and I moved it to the facial of the implant. There's now a gap of two millimeters on the crest. I don't care. How fast does epithelium grow? Half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. One week post-op, you can see the, the tissue is already healing. I remove the sutures. Looks Three awesome. Post-op. I have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. I have a very healthy uh, integration of my implant, and I can make a nice uh, implant retained crown uh, for our patient. I'm not going to show that. Um, let me show that. Get done here. This is. A, can I show this last one? I, yeah, well, please. I'm not sure how much time we have, but this is this is one where we use allograft material. So we have a we have two bicuspid teeth. The patient uh, bit down, was in pain. Uh, sent her to endo. Came back. The teeth are, are fractured. They need to come out. So again, same procedure. Uh, we're going to atraumatically remove the teeth. I'm using the physics forcep as I described uh, previously. The teeth are luxated up and out of the socket. Cool, right? Obviously, what do we do next, docs? Curette, 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 curette. When we're curetting, we're removing granulation, we're removing purple blood, but we're also evaluating the availability of facial plate of bone. And I determined that I didn't have it. Can't see it radiographically, so I'm going to incise. If I can't see it, I'm going to incise. Again, when I make my incision, I'm doing that envelope reflection. I'm not making vertical incisions into mucosa. Can you see how we've lost the facial plate of bone? Mm -hmm. I'm going to reflect the palatal. And then again, not going through the implant process. Uh, I have no facial plate of bone here, but I'm going to go through my pilot burr, widening the osteotomy, placing my implant into position. But you can see I, you have thread showing on the facial aspect. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to graph this site with allograft material, human bone from another human, what did I say? Concentric circle in my discussion. I must protect that allograft from invagination of epithelium. You must. I must passively place a resorbable membrane, a high quality resorbable membrane, not a collagen plug, at least two millimeters beyond the defect. This is a rule that cannot be broken, docs. I know we've grafted. I know we've put membranes. I know the membranes have fallen out. And I know that sometimes the cases are unpredictable where we didn't get bone or the implants failed. If you follow this simple recipe, graft, membrane, at least two millimeters beyond the defect. Here we're going to graft, allograft, we're wetting our allograft material. Here's our resorbable membrane. Cut it to size. Uh, there's different, different types. This happens to be from, from golden ass, from golden dent. And the membrane is an epiguide membrane. It's a synthetic membrane, very high quality. We don't have to get into that, those great details. My dad was a carpenter, so I, re <laughs> I remember this. It's very important that you measure at <laughs> once. Um, if you, if you, membranes are expensive. And if you happen to, to not cut it properly, you can overlap two pieces together. 
But here you can see I passively place my membrane on the facial aspect. There's nobody holding this. I'm not wrestling with it. I'm not forcing it. I'm not tucking it. I'm not ripping it. I'm not tearing it. I, Because I reflected so well, I know exactly where that membrane is, and I know it's at least two millimeters beyond the defect. That becomes my new wall. I'm taking my wetted allograft material, and I'm simply passively placing that membrane onto the palatal surface uh, of the, the reflected palatal tissue. Again, I'm not holding it, right? I'm not fighting this. And then we're gonna use my suture technique that I demonstrated earlier, from the crestal to the facial, and over to the crestal to the palatal, and I simply sutured it in place to hold that membrane. Again, imperative that this membrane be in place for at least six weeks. Epithelium physiologically is gonna grow a half a millimeter, millimeter a day. I'm not concerned whatsoever that that membrane is exposed. What type of uh, sutures are you using there? <clears throat> um, these are Vicryl, uh, the Vicryl sutures. They're, they're resorbable sutures. I see my patients uh, in a week to 10 days, no matter what, because uh, oftentimes they'll, they'll demonstrate symptoms, you know, inflammation or, or discomfort as the, situ uh, the tissue's healing, the sutures won't let it. Um, so they're, they're uh, polyglycolic acid uh, sutures. They resorb to water. Uh, so they're very, very clean. We don't get a lot of plaque accumulation on them. It heals. We place our implants. We take our impression. We make some nice sounds with a band of attached gingiva. Docs, we can grow bone atraumatic. We can grow bone predictably 100% of the time as long as you follow certain rules. Um, I was told 40 minutes um, are... are did we have enough today? I was, it was fantastic. It was great. What do you think, Jason? Do you have any, there were a couple questions that people had asked. Um, one person was, you had a, 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 a suturing sequence. The, I think it was a second case where you had sutured kind of around the healing abutment and right. someone had asked, um, the, the suit, the suture won't slide up and off the healing abutment. So they were uh, curious about that. Oh, that's a great question. The healing abutment is, that's a great question. It is tall enough that that it'll loop around, but you can always have your assistants take an instrument and hold it down on that on that lingual surface a little bit as you're tying your knot. You know, once you once you create tension on it, it's not going to move. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's 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 learning. Um, what I would do, um, if if I if you wouldn't mind, uh, Lee Silverstein, S I L B R S T I N, has a suture book. That's Hard a great to find. Thing. You can't get it on Amazon. They charge like nine hundred dollars for it. Yeah. Go to Salvin Dental, S-A-L-V-I-N Dental. They they sell it for like 100 bucks, 90 bucks, $99, something like that. And it's it's all uh, drawings. And uh, you can practice at home. Bring it at home. You got nothing else to do. Uh, take an orange and stick a pencil in it and, and suture around it. You can really practice all the different suturing techniques that we use in dentistry really, really effectively. Okay, so Kurt from Golden uh, has been telling me about the courses you guys give a bunch. And, and like, after seeing this, I'm like, oh, okay. Cause the other thing is for me, that's a, that's a pretty quick drive. Tell us a little bit about how you, where you teach and how you teach. Cause you've got a hands-on course in, in the Metro Detroit Metro area. Basically. Yep. Is that right? So, so at the, at the university of Detroit dental school, uh, we, uh, we have a golden dent. Kurt has, has two programs. One is an extraction course. Mm -hmm. That's one day on a Friday. Um, they, they uh, do it at the dental school. These are not dental school patients. These are patients that are, are um, brought into, into the dental school. Uh, we really help the community a lot. And every doctor in the course of the day probably will remove 30 teeth. Oh, wow. Uh, with instructors there. So it's very hands-on. And as I said, the, the technique is, is that it's technique sensitive. I mean, you have to learn the technique because we all we, our muscle memory says squeeze. Mm -hmm. And you know what, if you're going to break facial plate, it might, might as well be in a learning ex experience rather than, um, rather than uh, on, your, on your patients in your practice. Sure. So, and then they also have a two-day where it's extraction and grafting. Uh, first day is all lecture. And then the second day, again, uh, we bring you over to the dental school where everybody will uh, not only extract, but you will reflect, you will graft with three or four different materials and suture, <laughs> including membranes, on live patients. That's amazing. So it's a whole day of learning. Uh, it's not a class where you're going to sit and read the newspaper because you're, you're working, um, but it's a great experience. If you really want to get proficient and efficient 
in your extraction techniques and your grafting techniques. It's wonderful and it's local. Okay, so I know I know for a fact people are asking, uh, what if I'm from Kentucky and well, we it's also in Michigan? Have, we also you can come into Michigan. Detroit is is wonderful. The airport is wonderful. <laughs> it is. The hotel, it is. the hotel that they put you in is four star. It's it's great. They show you back and forth. It's very safe. What about what about licensing? Uh, you, you don't. It's because it's through the university that that's not a problem. Nice. That's yeah. what everyone wanted to know. Yeah, and we have another program in Charlotte, North Carolina, at the Engel Institute, E N G Institute. Mm -hmm. North Carolina is an open state, so again, you do not need to be licensed. <laughs> And again, uh, at that course, it's a little bit different. It's it's a three day program where you do lecture, you do extractions, you do grafting, we do PRP, we draw blood, we do all kinds of different things. So a little bit different course, but but very high quality. Nice. That's really cool. That's awesome. Like I'm thinking maybe after people listening to this, they're going to want to. I'm I'm going to get down there and take those courses because it's such an easy drive for me. And then maybe the Dental Hacks Nation will, we can report back. That's pretty Perfect. cool. Love to do that. Well, thank you very much for being yeah, on. This awesome. was fantastic. It's all really good information. I'm sure that if you if you guys have any uh -oh. questions or comments, oh, oh, I guess we lost him. Oh, no. There you go. If you have questions or comments about what uh, Dr. Kaczynski presented, uh, leave them here in the Dental Hacks Nation. We'll make sure he gets them. And like I said, maybe we'll try and organize uh, organize some people to go take the course. It looks really good, and that was fantastic stuff. So thanks yeah. a ton, guys. Yeah, stay safe out there, guys. That's right. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye.